Welcome to TPI the Podcast. In this episode, Managing Editor Lizzie Arbogast Gwynn sat down recently with Alabama Supreme Court Associate Justice Sarah Stewart to discuss Stewart's run for Supreme Court, the challenges and successes of Alabama's legal system, and her experience being a female in a once male dominated field. I'm Lizzie Arbogast Gwynn, sitting with Sarah Stewart. Welcome. Thank you. We are here for an episode of TPI Talk for International Women's Month, and we are very excited to have Ms. Stewart here. She is running for Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court. Right. Thank That's you. awesome. So glad I'm here. Thank you for making time. Of course. Thank you for being here. So first of all, tell me a little bit about yourself and where you're from and what you, how you got into politics and all that kind of stuff. Okay, um, so sort of a soliloquy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, um, kind of going backwards. So I've been on the Supreme Court for five years, and um, before that I was a circuit court judge in Mobile for 13 years. Before that I practiced law for about 14 years. Um, went to law school at Vanderbilt Law School. Uh, lived in Jackson, Mississippi. Worked for a department store called McCray's. You're probably too young to remember them. Don't remember it. (laughs) Um, So they got bought out by like Parisians and then Pazits, and and it was a long time ago. (laughs) But I met my husband there. He was a buyer, and we got married in 1989. Before that, I went to the University of Arkansas where I got a bachelor's and a master's degree in communication. And then I went to high school in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And before that, it gets more complicated. Mm. My dad was a petroleum geologist, so we lived overseas from the time that I was five months until I was 14. And we Very lived in cool. such exotic countries like Libya and Indonesia. Awesome. But we lived in Australia, and that was pretty cool. Oh, so, yeah. Very cool. So that's my, my kind of background. So what led you into politics? So politics was um, kind of a just a happenstance. When I was practicing law, we had a really good group of judges in Mobile. And I was kind of always interested in being a judge, but maybe just like a district judge, not. Circuit court judges do all the jury trials. That seemed like a lot. (laughs) And there was um, actually no women on the bench at all. We had one domestic court judge, and she was a female. But everybody else was a man. And so I was a little intimidated by that. Mm -hmm. You know, this is um, 2000 to like 2005. But then one of our... um, Judges died of lung cancer, and the other judges came to me and said, we really want you to think about applying for this position. I was like, okay, but I'm not from Mobile. I didn't go to the University of Alabama (laughs) Law School. I'm not from Alabama, you know. And um, you're female. And I'm female. (laughs) Um, Of course, they were all men, so I didn't say that to them. But So I I wasn't sure if that was going to work out. But we have a judicial selection committee in Mobile, and I was on the list of three, and then Governor Riley picked me and appointed me in 2006. So that was really cool. And then I got involved with um, the circuit judge's leadership while I was a circuit judge, eventually becoming the first female president of the Circuit Judges Association. But by doing that, I you know, had lots of friends all over the state, ran the judicial education part for about 10 years for them. And um, at the time, the Alabama Supreme Court didn't have any trial judges on the court. And a group of people came to me and said, we would really like to have a trial judge on the Supreme Court. And I said, well, I'll find you one, because I'm not interested in doing that. I'm happy in my world. I'm about, you know, probably will be presiding judge one day. And, you know, I'm, I love Mobile. I don't want to move to Montgomery. And, you know. So um, it just sort of devolved from there that nobody would do it. And so I said, okay, I'll try it because it was what we call a free run. I didn't have to give up my seat to run for it. Okay. And so if I'd lost, I could just continue being a circuit court right. judge. And I ended up winning. And so then, it, I mean, I remember when we won, we had a runoff, and I'm sitting in my living room. I didn't even have, like, a watch party or anything. And I'm sitting in my <laughs> living room with my children and some people that helped me from my campaign my campaign manager was calling me saying, are you watching TV? And I'm like, well, no, I'm, I'm making dinner, but, you know, I'll try to do that. <laughs> and so um, we were looking at the returns. They come in, and then my phone um, rings, and it's the person I was running against. 
and he's actually a friend of mine, and still a good friend of mine, and he calls me and says, hey, um, I'm going to concede. I was like, you can't concede? That's like 40% of the returns oh, are in. Right. And he was like, well, but we have people who are keeping track, and the big ones that are boxes are left to come from Mobile and Baldwin County, and we, you know, we assume that you did really well there, so we're just not going to be able to make it up in numbers. Um, and I walk back in the living room, and I look at my kids, and they're like, what? So I think we won. <laughs> They're like, oh, it's like this is good. I don't. I hadn't even thought about how this is going to really impact our lives. Yeah. I have to think about how we're going to arrange this. So it, it was. It was a good time because my oldest daughter was graduating from college and my youngest daughter was graduating from high school. Mm. Um, so it, it worked out that the time period that I've been on the court, they were in college or out out of the house. Yeah. And so it's it's been better. Than it might have been, and they were nine and six when I became a circuit court judge, so they'd only known mom as a judge, and mm -hmm. their world was pretty constrained. They never got invited to the cool parties. They, you know, judges' kids are like missionary or <laughs> preachers' kids, right? Nobody yeah. asks them to come to anything. So, yeah, yeah, I get that. Um, so obviously now you're running for chief justice. Right. So something about this last five years you've enjoyed. So tell yeah. me a little bit about that. What sure. What have you enjoyed? What have you accomplished? Yeah. And what what makes you want to take it a step further? Well, it's I could have run for a re-election to my spot, um, and I don't think I would have had any opposition, and that probably would have been an easy thing for me to do. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the current Chief Justice, we have a cap. You have to be can't run again once you reach the age of 70. So he ages out. Okay. So the position is open. And the 13 years that I was a trial court judge and then the five years that I've been on the Supreme Court, and the relationships that I've made with the judges, and I've worked really well with the legislature, I felt like I had some tools to be able to bring to the position. But, but more importantly also is that when Chief Justice Parker gets out of office, he'll be the first Chief Justice we had for a full term since 2001. So we've averaged a new Chief Justice every two and a half years. Wow. So when you do that, you have that kind of churn in leadership mm -hmm then you don't really have any long-term strategic planning. It's really hard to keep up with the salaries, keep up with the, the evolution of technology, all of those things. So we have a real need in the court system. And Chief uh, Justice Parker has worked really hard to try to stabilize a lot of that. But there's mm -hmm. obviously still lots of work left to be done. So I think the main reason why I'm running for this is because I want, you know, it's hard to be a trial judge. I mean, I, as when I've sat there, I mean, I've watched you know, victims fall apart when the person that mm -hmm. hurt them come in the courtroom. Watch children testify about the abuse that they suffered. Mm -hmm. And it you take that back home with you. Yeah. And it's really hard to manage all of that. And so I want to give all of our judges all the tools that I can to really be the best judges that they can be. And we need more training. We need more management uh, resources. We need leadership training. We need um, but our support staff is great, but they also don't have any training. And so there's just a lot left to be done. We don't have like a training manual that you would think you would come mm -hmm. into a business, like how to do your job. Right. We, don't, we don't have one of those for any position um, mm -hmm. in the system. So we have 2,100 employees. We have a $300 million budget. We have wow. courthouses or you know offices in every county. A lot of counties have more than one. And so... It's, it's like the CEO of a major corporation, mm -hmm. and you need to walk into that with some understanding of how the system works. And so that's why I'm, I'm running. Wow, that's a lot. There's so much more to it than you yeah. think. You think Supreme Court, and you just think yeah. that, you know, the people that make the big decisions, right? right. But there's so much more yeah. to so it behind the scenes. There is, and, and that's <laughs> really kind of like our Constitution on the chief's shoulders to, to handle the administrative piece mm -hmm. of the trial court system. And so the Supreme, the justice part of the Chief Justice's role, you know, I've done that for the last five years, and I feel comfortable with that. But the the administrative part of it is the challenge, mm -hmm. and we we have human resources needs, we have IT needs, we, um, you know, we have a, really an epidemic of juvenile crime going on across mm -hmm. the state, and there there needs to be some deliberateness and thoughtfulness about how we get our arms around that. Yes. Like one of the programs that I'm really excited about is. A lot of the district attorneys um, are <clears throat> implementing this program called Helping Families Initiative. And what it is, is there are all these studies correlating truancy in third, fourth, and fifth grade, 
with eventual contacts with juvenile justice. So what we're trying to do is get services to those kids. Why are they truant? Um, sometimes it's because um, they don't have any running water, mm -hmm. they don't have any food, they don't have transportation, yeah. and sometimes yeah. the parents don't care and they need to spend some time in jail yeah. to get their attention. So all of that takes the resources of the district attorneys and the law enforcement, the judicial system, and then to run those programs effectively, the legislature needs to get involved. And there has been a lot of interest in the legislature in trying to attack crime at that level. Right. Because once they're in juvenile justice, then the large majority of them end up in mm -hmm. you know, big court, circuit yeah. court, looking at serious charges. Right. So how do we pinch off that pipeline? And that's kind of one of the pieces we're looking at. Another um, big piece is mental health. I mean, it's a huge mm -hmm. issue. Our probate judges all around the state are having to wrestle with that daily with um, proceedings that they have to do to decide whether somebody needs help um, involuntarily <laughs> or yeah. involuntarily to get into a, a place where they can get some treatment. But we also have those same problems with the court system and the sheriffs and the jails. We in Mobile, we have about 40% of our population that needs psychotropic drugs, wow. which is super expensive for us. And then, of course, when our law enforcement officers are countering those people in the field, it's mm -hmm. really dangerous for them. It's dangerous for the people. So how can we, can we do something different with that? And in Tuscaloosa, they had built a mental health crisis center up there mm -hmm. to where their police officers, instead of taking them to jail first and then waiting some amount of days before they can get them into a mental health facility through the probate court system, mm -hmm. We are just take the officers are taking them directly to the mental health crisis center where they can provide services, and so it just cuts that whole piece out, helps with overcrowding, over and helps the judicial system deal with it. And there, it's not like they're getting away with the crime. It's just right. This is what the issue is, and so you know, as a trial court judge, I'd say probably eighty percent of everything I saw in the criminal world was related to drugs. Um, a lot of that is people that have mental illness and they're self-medicating with drugs, but sometimes it's the other way too, right? They're, they have mental illness because they've been so addicted to drugs for a right. long time. So all of that, that mental health piece is super challenging, I think, for Alabama, mm -hmm. but it's really something we've got to address too. And I think that also goes back to kind of the whole debate about, you know, is the jail system meant to be re rehabilitative or right. punitive right and that, what does that look like right um and I, and I think the way we've got it sort of developed in alabama right now is um you know it's supposed to, it, it does both mm -hmm. but they in as judges i mean we've tried to when new judges come in and we're teaching them or we have our judges conferences we talk a lot about the goals of incarceration and you know what we're trying to do because Unless you're going to lock people up for the rest of their lives, right. which we could never afford. Right. Um, those or people, never want to do. Right. Um, some people. For do. the most part. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, those people are going to come back home, and then they're going to come back home. The recidivism rate when people come out of prison with no mm. access to anything is almost 40%. Wow. But if we have, we have these different, we call them accountability courts, that we are trying to set up across the state. And it's like a diversion court, but you're still trying to hold people accountable for the harm they did. So there's like a drug court, and there's a mental health mm -hmm. court, family courts, um, and veterans courts. And so we are able to get mostly nonviolent offenders into those programs. They last varying amounts of, of time. The mental health court usually is the longest one because it takes a long time to help people realize they have to stay on their meds because they start feeling better and they're like, okay, I don't need this medicine anymore. Mm -hmm. And then they just cycle back down. So mm -hmm. you, you, that takes a few cycles to get them to understand they have to stay with their meds all the time. So w we have all of those programs. They save the state a lot of money, which is always a legislative concern. But it also lets those people go back out in the community and have jobs and function with society. And, you know, all those people usually have children and it helps their kids thrive mm -hmm. and do better. And so it's just, it needs to be a different back. way of looking at things. And so, you know, Cam Ward, who is on the board of, board of, what's he, 
Bureau of, uh, Bureau of Pardons and Paroles, I think is what it's called mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the, his programs that he's focused on with some of the members of the legislature is kind of a, a relapse prevention that would be done at the end of somebody's incarceration term out of prison to try to help them. And the number one imp impediment is no transportation. Yeah. And then, but once we can get people transportation, then usually we can find them a job. There are a lot of great employers across the state who are willing to take mm -hmm. felons for, to come and help them work, but they got to get to work, mm -hmm. and they have to get to work on time. And that, that's always just a big issue. So one of the things that we've talked about internally within our trial courts in these accountability courts is trying to get the faith-based communities involved because mm -hmm. a lot of them have vans and are willing to move people around for us to help with that transportation piece. Obviously, I've thought a lot about yeah. a lot of these no, issues. No, I love that. That's things awesome. that we've, we've you know, just experienced and tried to work around and through for the last 18 years. But it seems like you're solution-driven. Is, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You want to find that solution and solution work toward it. And, and team driven, right? Yes. We can't do this in a silo. We have to we have to reach out to the other branches of government. We have to make teams within our own branch, like how we're going to attack like mental health. I mean that's that's something we have to do with probate judges. We have mm -hmm. to do with um, our district and circuit court judges and, and that's within the judicial branch, but then we have to be able to reach out to law enforcement. Um, the DAs, all the other pieces of that to try to make that work right. for our branch. Perfect. So, yeah. um, and then lastly, you kind of touched on this, but before I let you go, I, I want to talk about being a female in a yeah. leadership role and yeah. in a mostly male-driven industry. I came yeah. from the sports world, so yeah. <laughs> um, I'm well aware of, the, of that. And, and sort of how have you come overcome some of those, sure. um, some of those obstacles? Yeah. So I got to law school in 1992, and at that time, I think about a third of, of law students were women. Wow. And now over half of law students are women. So there's, there's definitely been a change in who is coming out of law school. And then when I got out and sort of went through the law firm structure, and m lots of women dropped out of the profession to have children. And I decided that I was going to stay in, and I think of the women my age who stayed in active all through raising their children, um, there might be 10 of us in Mobile, which is out of 1,200 lawyers is a lot. Yeah. yeah. And so, but today I see those same young women staying in. And part of that is um, the firms are becoming much more aware of child care needs, and the men are also saying, hey, I also mm -hmm. need to be able to go to baseball games and do these different things with my kids. And so... They, they want to have that equal time, too. So I think a lot of the firms have adjusted their requirements mm -hmm. to meet the needs of not only the women but the men. So that lets the women stay in the profession. But I, I recently was really honored um, by getting this Trailblazer Award from the Mobile Bar Association. I was... I thought about being insulted for a little bit because it's like it's not the end that you give that to people who are leaving or <laughs> the end of their work. <laughs> I'm still working. <laughs> so, but it, 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 they didn't mean it that way at all. But they did want to recognize you know, that I was the first circuit judge um, yeah. that did jury trials in Mobile, that you know the leadership that I gave to the Circuit Judge Association. And there, there's been very few women on the Supreme Court and mm -hmm. um, only three female Chief Justices, I would be the third, so two others. So it, it, it really makes a difference. I mean, one of my big things is it's important to have people in these different roles that look like the people that are coming up. Mm -hmm. So you know, you need to have women in leadership roles so that young girls that are coming up are like, I can do that too. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's been a, a driving force for me. I think the other thing that really helped me succeed with all of that is that I did become a trial judge when I was when my kids were nine and six. And so, you know, it was hard when I was in a jury trial or something like mm -hmm. that to be able to leave. And that inevitably they had the um, honors assemblies at 10 o'clock in the morning, which is like either do it <laughs> really early or really late, but 10 yeah. o'clock is like right in the middle of the work day. <laughs> I have no chance to react to that. So that was, um, but that was a, an easier way to do it than maybe working for a big firm mm -hmm. where there's a lot more pressure to be in person every day at your desk from 8 to 6. Right. And we had the, the ability to use this computer program called Alicourt 
where I could work on my motion docket, on the orders that I need to do and all of that at home mm -hmm. after my kids went to bed at 7.30. And so then I would put in kind of the rest of my work day mm -hmm. from 7.30 to like 11 and then get up at 6 and do it all over again. So, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with lots of people who juggle children mm -hmm. and work that way, but... Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, and I do think Alabama for is rather progressive in its women. I mean, you look at yeah. of having a female governor and things like that. Um, you know, how do you think that, like you said, um, being in that role can help further women yeah. down the line? Well, it, it, again, part of it is seeing that it can be done. Yeah. I mean, I think, like, Governor Ivy has really been active in girls' state for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really helped. I mean, Senator Britt came up through Girl State, and now she's a senator, and she's 41 years old. So that helps mm -hmm. all these young girls say, you know what, I can be a senator one day too. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's pretty remarkable to be able to have that kind of leadership all over our state mm -hmm. be women. So I think um, seeing it is helpful. And then I, I know that um, Senator Britt, and I know myself, um, Justice Kelly Wise is one of the other justices on the Supreme Court, we feel like we have an obligation to go out in the communities and talk to people about what we do and kind of understand what how it can be done, what the path there was, so that we can help people, women, think about, okay, I, here's how I can do that. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of kids, when especially in high school right now, and some in college, and I've had the same discussion with my own daughters at least two or three times each, career paths are not linear. I mean... We all say to people when they're in 10th and 11th grade, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? Uh, yeah. But that, it's, that's so unfair it's not, because yeah. very few people were doing what they thought they were going to do in 10th grade. Right. And, so, and doing it all the yeah, way through. And doing it all the way through. So, I, you know, I thought I was going to do... Um, so I started out as a geophysics major in, at Arkansas. Okay. I was going to go into the oil industry like my dad. And organic chemistry and I had a, had a coming to um, a part meeting, and it didn't work out well for me. So I had to change. And um, so then I became a communications major. Well, what am I going to do with that? So then I went into um, retail for a while. And that was okay. I, it was, But it wasn't anything that I was passionate about. So then I was like, okay, well, maybe I'll go to law school. Mm -hmm. to law school. So just none of those paths are linear at all. Right. And if you look at a lot of really interesting women um, and look at that, sometimes they were bartenders or sometimes they ran little companies and, and the path is not linear at all. Yes. So I absolutely. think that's something we really need to try to explain to young girls especially that you can you can do all these things. It's okay. Yeah. So well, yeah. that's awesome. What yeah. an inspiration. Thanks. Well, thank you for joining us. Sure. I really appreciate it. Yeah. What's on your sure. schedule for the rest of the day? Um, we have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have some lunches. What, we have a lunch? Or Although he called time. it a dinner or what? supper, what? dinner. <laughs> oh, a cat? Um, no. No, no, we're, we're going to, we're touring with Jeff Land. Oh, you're yeah, touring. Yeah, a cat. We're yes. him at Betty Carroll, and we have a 12 p.m. dinner. And, oh. <laughs> and I always make sure to put 12 p.m. so people know when I say dinner, I mean middle of the day, <laughs> at uh, Judge Mitchell's office. We've got a group of people oh. together okay. for a lunch in yeah. there, and then we're going to tour the municipal complex with the mayor, and then I'm going to mercifully let Judge Stewart go. <laughs> Well, we but, appreciate you coming sure. to Talbot County uh, and, absolutely. and to touring around and absolutely. meeting us. And it, it, one of the things that I found kind of remarkable as we traveled around the state, when I went to Lynette, what county is that? Chambers County. Chambers, Chambers County. County. When I went over there, I was on their the newspaper way. above the fold, front page. You know, justice comes, and no one can ever remember a justice coming to Lynette before. So wow. that, that was sad, but it... But I've made it, tried to make a commitment to going not only to every circuit, but to the counties within the circuit. And um, the Fifth Circuit, which is this one over here, has four counties mm -hmm. in it. So it's it's a lot. And they don't get a lot of love. I mean, like when I went to Lynette, it was like, don't forget it's Eastern time. I was like, Eastern time? <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. It is Eastern time. Yeah. Yep. Yep, yeah. there in Valley. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you stopping in sure. and joining us. Appreciate you doing this. I, I, I really do. It's uh, Yeah. Fun to kind of talk about, you know, I guess when you're 60, you look back and you think, wow, I've done a lot. 
and then like, Come but on. I'm only 60. <laughs> so yeah. there's more to do. There's more to do. There's always <laughs> that's, more that's to right. do. Well, thank you all for joining us as sure. well. This has been another episode of TPI Talk. Thanks for listening to TPI, the podcast. We would appreciate your support and you can do that with links in the show notes.